Did that change, or is that all right? It's okay. Okay. You comfortable enough? I'm ready. You Are sure? you ready? Let me know when you're ready. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> all right, welcome everyone. My name is Mark Hummel, and welcome to Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. I'm in Berkeley. We're at uh, Magic Dick's hotel room, and I'm doing an interview with my friend, Magic Dick. Hello. Hello, monsieur. Hello. And uh, Magic Dick, if you don't know it by now, is the original harmonica player in the Jay Giles band the entire time since That's 1968. Right. Was that it? I think so. 68, okay. 67, 68 is kind of when we started. And um, yeah, it's... Okay. And... And what, what we're going to talk about is Dick's career in, in uh, rock and blues. We're going to talk about uh, uh, Magic Dick's beginning in... Uh, uh, now, you were in, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts? I grew up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Right. It's a small city. Outside of the, Springfield, is that right? Well, it's, it's, it's basically um, fairly close to the uh, New York State border. Border okay. between uh, Massachusetts and New York, right, and uh, and just kind of how you got started because I know you played uh, trumpet as a youngster. Now, how, w weren't you like ten or twelve when you started? I was nine years old, so third, years it was old. third grade. Okay, wow. And uh, I was fortunate enough that my parents um, would support me in wanting to play, uh, you know, to take trumpet lessons. I have an older brother named Steve. He's four years older than me, and he started on clarinet. And he was pretty good. And um, we were actually both studying with the same teacher. This teacher could teach like clarinet, trumpet, several of those instruments. And he was a good teacher. So that's how I got my, get, my beginning, and it, it really set the stage for my entire conception, I'd say, of... Uh, a musical sound, a tone, you know, yeah. and the association of uh, breath, you know, with right. the Im the oral image of a musical tone. Now, were your parents uh, musical? Well, they loved they loved music, but they weren't they didn't play music. Uh -huh. My my mother um, sometimes sang in the in the choir at the uh, at the temple, but they were very encouraging, you know, as far as uh, what I wanted to do. And my mother was always exhorting to me, like when I'd be practicing on the trumpet, she'd go, play sweetly. Hmm. You know? But her concept of playing sweet was like, to sound like Harry James. Right. Who to me had way too much syrup in the, uh, vibrato, you know, of his approach on trumpet. Right. So I ended up liking um, real jazz players quite a lot more, you know. Now, were, your, uh, were, were you and your brother both in, a, uh, in the school band? No. Okay. Well, I was, in a, I was in the school band a bit, but I was more of a loner. I, uh -huh. I didn't really like being that involved in the school band. Yeah. Know? And I also got an opportunity to fool around in the instrument room with a acoustic bass oh, okay. for the first time in my life. Yeah. And that was like, you know, the first time you ever tried something like that, it was pretty uh, pretty cool. <laughs> but it never went anywhere for me with that. So it, I, I would think that your love for jazz would come, oh, let's turn this off. Mm -hmm. I'm just afraid that's Good dinging, idea. That's dinging too much. <clears throat> Okay. Um, I was going to say, being being a trump, trumpet player from the very beginning, your brother being a clarinet player, mm -hmm. I would think that that kind of opened the door for you in terms of an interest in jazz at a pretty early age. Absolutely. Yeah. I saw at a very early age, my Uncle Harry, one of my mother's brothers, was uh, took me to see this uh, Chicago jazz band. And he knew all these guys in the band, like uh, Max Kaminsky, P. 
Pee Wee Russell. Oh, wow. Bud Freeman. Whoa. Uh, George Wetling on drums. Yeah. And, like, my mind was blown from that. Yeah. You know? What were they and called? And they came, when... and during a break, they came over to the to our table because Harry knew them. Now, weren't they called the Over the Hill Gang or they had some kind of name? Well, like some that? of them had, I think, some asso association with that, but I forget what they actually... Yeah, they had all called. met in high school, though, in Chicago. Yeah, I'd that say so, yeah. Yeah, no, they had. And these cats were, yeah. you know, they went way, way back. Yeah, they um, went back to Jack Teagarden they, and yeah. Big Spider back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, Benny, Benny Goodman even hung around them, even though yeah. they, they weren't necessarily. Yeah. And, um, but dur during one of the breaks at this um, club where they were playing, <clears throat> Pee Wee Russell came over and sat down. Now, Pee Wee Russell is a genius on mm -hmm. the clarinet. He is definitely considered a jazz genius yeah. with, with kind of a unique style, his own style. And uh, that was really a trip for me to actually sit as close to him as we are right wow. now. You know? yeah. um, and I just took it all in, like, yeah. loved it. Now, how old were you? Uh, so, so that would have been, you were how old when, the, when you saw those guys? I was about 12. 12, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have some... Some stuff that goes way back in terms of uh, an interest in jazz, it sounds like. That's right. And yeah. still have a deep interest and in it. And you do still have a deep yeah. interest in jazz, yeah. yeah. And um, I'm just, I know that with uh, with that, you eventually got into harmonica. As a, was that in your late teens that you got into harmonica? I started playing the harp when I was 21. Oh, you were 21? Yeah. Wow, that yeah. is so late. That's the first time I, I uh, picked it up. Yeah. Except for when I was three years old, sick with the flu, my mother bought me a Marine Band harmonica, huh. thinking it would cheer me up. Right. And uh, it cheered me up so much, I was jumping up and down on the <laughs> bed. You know, I was jumping up and down on the bed like it was a trampoline. Right. And I could see it like a movie, like right, I remember it so well. Huh. So with with uh, harmonica, now, had you stopped playing the trumpet by that time, or, or how did that go? No, um, I played. I was I was playing the trumpet fairly regularly um, from third grade on uh -huh. uh, until I until uh, until I went off to college. At which point, I was intending to be a, a physicist or a electronic engineer mm -hmm. or a mechanical engineer i loved all that stuff i yeah. loved everything you know and i spent i spent most of my time in the in the in the college library there were several libraries i spent most of my time in the library looking at every book mm -hmm. and not focusing on what i was supposed to be studying right i was just right. looking at every book and where were you going to school in boston worcester it was in worcester worcester, worcester massachusetts okay. right at Worcester Polytechnic, Polytechnic. It's, yeah, yeah which was a great is. Ivy League kind of yeah. uh, small engineering school. Yeah. So very formative for me. Is this where you that. got interested in harmonica? Yeah, I was. I came when I came home from my uh, second summer school session because. <laughs> You know, like I said, I spent most of my time in the libraries and not focusing so much on what I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. That translated to having to spend some time in summer school sessions there. Right. And um, when I came home from my second summer of doing that um, is when it serendipitously happened to me. I just sort of fell into it. And what, how did that happen? There was a music uh, a music store in town, or a couple of them, mm -hmm. and once in a while I'd go by there and look at the. Uh, they would have the all these harmonicas in a glass display right, case, right. you know, all lit up sure, in there like yeah. that. And um, years would go by, and I'd look at them and keep thinking, "Yeah, but I'm really into my trumpet." But I was very right. attracted to the uh, to the harmonicas. And particularly the uh, the chromatic, chromatic, the chromatic, yeah, yeah. Huh. in its various embodiments. And back then, they look the Honer ones look look the same as they do now, right? You know the the super chromatica, the twelve hole, mm -hmm. and um, so that's that's how it began for me. It it was by chance, really. You know. So do, did you just buy one, or did someone yeah. give you one? No, I bought one. You bought one. I bought one. 
And how did you decide what to play? Well, I knew what I wanted to play because I was a big fan of uh, of anybody, any recordings that I could find that were a great harmon that was great harmonica stuff. Oh, okay. You know? So you already knew. I already about knew people. I yeah. already knew about the Harmonicats, for example. Right. You know, I loved Jerry Murad's uh, chromatic playing. Right. I loved that whole group. To the yeah. truth, I thought they were just unbelievable, and there were several others too, but. It wasn't until the blues thing happened for me, mm -hmm. which um, I started playing the Marine Band when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And within, I would say within a month or two, I discovered the, uh, as happens to many players, the, uh, the Best of Muddy Waters, mm. that recording. Okay. Uh, which was really d definitive. That redefined kind of blues for me because... Before that point, I was listening to Sonny Terry, who was also really mind blowing. I know yeah, you and I yeah, are, are yeah, like we've talked about that just in, incredibly yeah. incredible interest in Sonny Terry, um, mm -hmm. as have as most harp players have. Mm -hmm. But once I heard the best of Muddy Waters, and then I got the best of Little Walter, I was so firmly into the camp of Chicago blues. Yeah and amplified harp and i stuck with that i mean yeah. it's you know but added my interest in in jazz to that kind of a sound in other words that's still my interest is that little walter kind of sound you know the amplified harp yeah, sound which or, almost or sounded or like a saxophone exactly yeah, it was between a saxophone type it was sound. perfectly between a trumpet yeah. and a sax right <clears throat> and um so that's what i loved and stuck with it yeah and to this day here we are and now we were talking yesterday about this this uh clip of you playing in what was it 1965 or 66 or something oh yeah and 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 that was with who that was with like your first band or something i think i think the uh the guys who who videotaped this was in black and white right and we did it in a studio at uh, I think it was at Boston University, hmm. and at that time we were becoming good friends with Barry Tashin, mm -hmm. who was the lead singer in the group Barry and the Remains. Diddy Wah Diddy. Right. They they opened for they opened for the Beatles the first time the Beatles played in the U.S. Wow. Yeah, I mean this was. And like, so he played drums. You said Barry. Was, yeah. Barry was a funky R and B drum, huh. drums and blues. Yeah. He'd sit in he'd sit in like a, a, an ordinary kind of chair, not not a drum stool. Right. Probably because there wasn't a drum stool around there right. at the time. So he just sat in this chair, you know, and he's one of the greatest natural drummers with this feel and singers. Barry was such a great singer. Huh. So one of the tunes that 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 we did on that uh, uh, s that thing you referred to was uh, Barry sang uh, Laundromat Blues. Okay, Albert King. Yeah, yeah. Albert King. You know, right. it ends with that. One more wash will do. Right. right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And Barry just I I really loved his singing, and anybody I knew, like you know, like Peter. Uh, Peter and Seth, we, right. we all acknowledged that this guy was incredibly great. Yeah. And a couple of times he came over to where we, uh, where the three of us lived, and um, he came over to sit in with uh, on some jams with us. And this with the early Jay Giles. Yeah, this was yeah. this was a, an early embodiment of the Jay Giles band before Seth uh, joined us. Okay. But on one particular day, Barry came over. And Seth was playing with us for the first time. Wow. We were set up in our living room. Hmm. And Barry jammed with us all afternoon. And uh, later on, he, he said to us after Seth had, had left, later on he said to us, that guy's really good. You should, you should really? get him. Wow. Yeah. So that had something to do with you guys hiring him, I'm sure. He, he certainly yeah. did. That endorsement. Yeah. 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 So... Um, so originally the band, the Jig Owls band, was you, uh, Jay, and uh, your bass player. Yeah, Danny Klein. Danny Klein. 
Right. DK, ace on bass. Right. So Danny Klein on bass, who did, and you didn't have Steve and Joe Blatt at that. Yes, we did. Oh, you Steven, did? Stephen okay. was playing. Uh, oh, okay. Well, Stephen was playing with us uh, by the time uh, Barry came over and okay. jammed with us. Interesting. So that was the, the Jay Giles blues band, right. actually, before we decided to drop the blues name yeah. part of it. And, bef and was that before... Um, I mean, was it was never the Jay Giles Blues Band with uh, Peter Wolf? Yeah, it, it was. was for a bit. Okay. But we realized, you know, because we like doing a lot of R&B as well as blues, mm -hmm. we quickly discovered that, you know, you would be restricting yourself right. in terms of what, what, they, you could do, yeah. what people yeah. thought you were, you know? Right. Why not just call it the Jay Giles Band? That makes band, sense, you know? yeah. And now, the reason it was called the Jay Giles Band was because before Peter ever came along, came along with us, we were a quartet. Mm -hmm. It was um, Jay, Danny Klein, myself, and a different drummer. Named, uh, and at this he, time, you were doing the singing. I was doing some of the singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were we were doing Chicago blues. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I don't think I was a very good singer at that point, but that's how it started. Well, what I find interesting is that when when I first got hit to you guys after the first album, it seemed, and I was already a big blues nut by that time, yeah. and, and it seemed like your guys' choice of material was kind of almost evidenced like record collectors. Yeah. You know, that you guys were not doing got my mojo work and you were doing, you know, uh, John Brim songs or... That's you know, right. Yeah. You, yeah. You, were, you were not doing the typical tried and true that a lot of, you know, yeah. typical blues bands were doing. I remember singing in that in that little session, that was the black and white video we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I remember singing uh, Be Careful, John right, Brim. Right, right, you know? exactly. I yeah. love that tune yeah. still to this day. It's a great song, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and his voice. Yeah, so the quality of that guy's voice was oh, just yeah. kind of menacing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, th that was one thing that I really dug about you guys is that your choice of material was was so um, it was it was so kind of like you know. Uh, there's other bands like that too. I mean, Can't Heat was obviously very oh, they were deep into the deep record. into record collecting. But the yeah. difference is they tended to do more. You know, they did Help Me and they did some songs. Yeah, that, you know, were kind of more tried and true. Right. Whereas you guys seem to steer clear of that and do you know like kind of the you know you did Orange Driver by Eddie Burns. Yeah. Just some really obscure stuff that was really killer stuff. Yeah, the Orange Driver thing. That's what. That was after Peter came in. Right. Peter was yeah. into that. Peter yeah. is an amazing record collector. I figured he was. Huge, yeah. huge amount of knowledge yeah. of all of that. Yeah. You know? And grew he, was, up, he grew up in, in Brooklyn. And he was a DJ? I don't know. Yeah. When, when we first met Wolf, he was um, a DJ at WBCN, which was okay. one of the first underground FM stations. Right. Uh, in in Boston, mm -hmm. and he was one of the first DJs there. And Wolf was a great DJ, still oh, is. Oh God, yeah, you can tell just from his patter. Yeah, yeah, his patter is obvious yeah. that he was a DJ. Yeah, yeah, it's going out to all the ships at sea, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. That's great. Wolf had a, he had it down. Man. Now, how did you and Jamie? That was another serendipitous thing. Three of us were were going to Worcester Polytechnic Institute mm -hmm. to become engineers. Oh, Danny wanted okay. Danny wanted to become a chemical engineer. Wow. Jay wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Yeah. And I wanted to be a physicist. What a trip! So one day I'm walking. One afternoon I'm walking across the quadrangle there, and I see these two guys sitting on the grass, one with an acoustic guitar, uh -huh. and Danny. It was Jay, that was Jay, and Danny was playing a. Uh, a single string washed up bass that he built himself. Wow. You know, the broomstick and the Crazy. and the string. Yeah. yeah, the old style washed yeah. up, yeah. Yeah. So I and I happen to have a 
a Marine Band harp in my pocket, uh -huh. just like most harp players, were right? Always, you know, <laughs> right. And I asked if I could sit in with them, and Jay said, "Sure, man." That's how it started. Wow. That's, that's exactly how it started. Well, you guys were all, sounds like all brilliant people. I well, mean, that's, I'll let you I say mean, that. No, I mean, I'm <laughs> saying you're, I know how smart you are already, but I'm saying, Thank you. I know you've told me things about Jay and just his, his knowledge. Of, oh, Jay was brilliant. Yeah, Jay, like a brilliant guy in terms of like he could work on race cars and yeah and amplifiers and and just right kind of anything in the studio right and the, yeah Jay i remember really you told me the thing about him splicing tape that was mind-blowing oh yeah we yeah. you know back then there was no digital editing or right. everything was analog yeah but jay you know that period of time was vietnam war right and we all had to worry about being drafted right and uh, when Jay went for the physical and the yeah. and the mental test, mm -hmm. they told him that he scored the highest on the on concentration of anybody they ever tested. Wow! And I'm not surprised. That's you know, heavy duty. That man. was like that was Jay. That yeah. is heavy duty. Yeah. He really had the ability to yeah. to focus and think clearly about, particularly like in the studio, yeah. what we were doing, yeah. or also uh, arranging tunes, you know, how to do, you know. Right. He was just Very stellar. Very sharp, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And a gas, yeah. To, a gas to work with, yeah. Jay. And you guys great. seem like you worked together. I mean, you worked together after the band kind of took a hiatus because you guys had blues time together. That's right. Yeah. How long did that last? Is that like five years or something? Uh, the period of time between yeah. the, when the band, like the band, the Jay Giles band stopped performing uh -huh. in 1984. Oh, really? Okay. And I formed Blues Time with Jay. Uh -huh. I was fronting the band, right. Jay on guitar, and then all the rest of the guys were different. But I formed that band in, um, in 19, I'd say 1990. Okay. I think it was. So you guys had had about six years of not... Yeah. Not really. Were you just not working at all? I mean, how did that go? I was riding my five Italian motorcycles uh -huh. <laughs> every day <laughs> for hours and hours. So there was probably... It was the only thing where, I was doing that right. made me feel like I was going somewhere. Right, right. You know? So I would imagine that you kind of got the attraction back for playing music. Yeah, eventually it came back. Yeah. And, um... So were you guys, when, when that happened, were you guys just burnt out? Was it just so many well, miles was, on the road? And I mean, I know you guys were basically hitting it really hard from the moment you signed for Atlantic, right? Yeah, yeah, it was intense. But, um, reel me back in here, I'm trying to, oh. Oh, like as far as. as so far I was as, depressed after after the band broke up. You were up depressed? It, depressed, yeah. didn't feel like playing. Um, and that that lasted until uh, eighty until eighty seven, mm -hmm. when uh, Mick Jagger called me up and wanted me to go to uh, Australia with his a solo project he was doing. Right, and that was an interesting. And this experience. is after you guys had already toured with them with the Stones. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we we knew each other. And, right. Um, I always liked him. Yeah. Well, I I, I love that picture that you sent me. Mm. with you and the Stones. Yeah, that's and, a nice and, shot. And, and it's like, you know, I mean, I've talked to you about this before, and I know that when you guys were touring with the Stones, in a way, you guys were kind of at the highest point in your career. In a lot of ways, they were kind of ebbing in their career, yeah. right? Mm. Well, so I'll let you say I mean, Well, I, I mean, I don't I, know. but I just you know. know that, I know you told me that when you guys played in Europe with them that, a lot of times, you know, you're you're you guys were the attraction on a lot of those shows because it seemed to be because you were so you know the records were so hot. Well, we had really, that by that time yeah. we we were we were tour, we had just finished a, an intense American tour on the heels of coming up. We had um, freeze frame and centerfold. Mm -hmm. Centerfold was number one on the charts. Yeah, on, number one on the pop charts. Right for eight weeks. Wow. That's and serious. that's yeah. you know that's serious. I think that's why they wanted us to come over. Sure, because and, that was uh, yeah. You guys were a transfusion for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I would think so. And how about Love Stinks? Was that on the same record, or was that at a was that on an earlier record? That's uh, I think there's an album title called Love. Isn't one of the albums called Love Stinks? Well, I know you have the song. I thought it could be. Yeah. I think I think it might yeah. be. It gets a little. <laughs> it gets fuzzy. It yeah. gets fuzzy. Well, how many know, albums listen. did you guys do in total? I don't know. Maybe like thirteen or fourteen. Wow. Maybe fifteen. Some okay. of them were live albums. Right. You know. And basically, the first five or six were Atlantic. Is that correct? Yeah. And then you switched over to EMI. Correct. Yeah, which was the big shot in right. the arm for you guys. Right. That that was a yeah. good move. And yeah. um, the first the first album on e EMI. Uh -huh. I think it was called Sanctuary. Right. Yeah. Alexis actually has that. What's that? We have a lot of your guys' records back in my yeah. house. Yeah. Between the ones I have and the ones she has. Yeah. 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 So um, I, I really liked what you were talking about um, with the band and how it was such a joint effort in terms of the way you guys con could construct your records, the way you constructed your songs, right. the way you were included on the harmonica in a way that almost no other bands. I mean, one of the reasons that I was, you know, that I was obviously attracted to Jay Giles' band was your playing on it, yeah, and thanks. that you were one of the few rock blues harmonica players. I had kind of gotten into you guys as a blues group mm -hmm. on the first two albums. Yeah. But, you know, eventually you guys kind of went into a more rock and roll and, and uh, almost, you know, commercial, a more commercial sounding yeah. territory. And at the same time, it was very much your own thing. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you were one of the first bands I saw, for that matter. I saw you guys yeah. at the Hollywood Palladium in 73 or something, 74. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, you know, you guys were a great great live act we were pretty intense. you guys were super intense <laughs> yeah, really intense and you guys every guy in the band had some kind of role to play and i love the thing that you were yeah. telling me yesterday which i never knew about doing somersaults into your solo yeah <laughs> wolf was always egging me on to yeah yeah Go for it, man. Yeah. You know? and i mean that that whole thing i mean that the 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 way you describe the band in terms of you know, both the camaraderie and the stage antics. And and at the same time, I mean, as any band that's on the road that much, there becomes this point of where, you know, people get, there's friction that starts to happen, especially like you were saying between Wolf and, and Seth, you know. Yeah, there was friction just from, day, from day one. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and then at the same time, here these guys are, they're writing songs together. And that's... Yeah. That's such a strange thing to me that people can write songs together at the same time, grow to dislike each other intensely. And it's, oh yeah, it was a it was a miracle, really. The yeah. way the way they could uh, work together. Right. Well, Seth, Seth had a lot of patience. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. And you know he was. Seth was super with this stuff. Yeah. The two the two of them had it was the right combination of. A lot of great ideas put through some good filters, mm -hmm. you know. Would they filter each, each other's stuff? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay, know. yeah. Like sometimes, you know, said to say something like, you know, that's too much like, uh, you know. Right, the, right. You know, something that is just a little too... <laughs> too <laughs> sugary. Yeah, or, yeah, 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 you know. That kind of thing, yeah. Um, yeah. But sometimes it was the other way too, you know. Peter, Peter was really good sometimes at just sort of immediately cutting off an idea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a lot of the fights would come about because um, certain ideas about a composition or what to do uh, weren't given a full airing. You know, right. if you cut the thing off before you've really explored it, it's kind of not not a great approach. So, right. To me, it's miraculous that they were able to uh, put it together that way. Sure. You know, despite the fact that they were like oil and water a lot yeah. of times. You know? Well, it's really interesting stuff. I mean, one of the things that's been really fascinating for me about doing these interviews 
is this whole thing of the way musicians interact with each other, the way musicians yeah. can actually stay together yeah. and still, you know, and still get on each other's nerves, but stay together nonetheless through a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but eventually it seems to always come to an end. It does. I mean, that's yeah. almost like just the way it is. is yeah. that, you know, and, yeah. and it's kind of like, you know, as you get older, all that stuff seems to change, too. Right. You know, a lot of things change. With well, there were issues, which I don't want to get into, but there right. were issues about the songwriting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Seth bristled at some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And um, so... That's really kind of why it came, it came to an ending when it did. You yeah. Know, and Peter wanted to go off and do his own thing. Right. You know? Right. So Which he, is another so thing. So he that, basically, you know, Peter happens. basically quit the band. Yeah. Yeah. He'll tell a different story, but the right. truth is. <laughs> right. He you know, quit the band. <laughs> Peter, you quit the band. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, again, you know, I mean, this, this reminds me of so many other stories of famous bands. I mean, you know, in a way, uh, some of the stuff with Lee and War, Lee Oscar yeah. and War, yeah. you know, similar things where there's infighting and one guy leaves the band and then next thing you know, they're cut out of the band. Right. Name. Right. Well, I know, remember Lee saying something like, they became basically a jam band because right. anytime they tried to actually get together and write some something, There'd always be all these fights. Right. So they just jam. That's how they became a jam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. It's kind uh, of brilliant. Yeah. You know? I mean, so th <laughs> there's just, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that seems to go on. Yeah. In terms of the creative aspects of, of playing in a band, especially, you know, when you talk about bands of, you know, your or Lee's caliber where, you know, you guys are hit makers. You guys are. Yeah. There's serious money involved. Yeah. Serious money involved. Yeah, and and of course, once you get to that, that's a motivating factor for keeping stuff together mm -hmm. and working through the you know this friction. Right. You know. And boy, I don't know how they did it. Quite honestly, looking back on it, it was stunning. You're saying Keith and I mean uh, Seth and and Peter. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And the rest of us, yeah. it'd be like. So you guys would just be kind of on the outs, outside of it in a way and let them do their Slightly. thing or whatever. Well, yeah. when we would get together yeah. and rehearse, which was damn near every day, wow. you know, work, yeah. on, work on stuff. Right. Um, it would typically work like Seth would have some ideas for a, for a song and we uh -huh. would start to work. He, he would suggest certain parts Jay, see if you can, you know, play this kind of thing. And Seth, Seth would play it on the organ or the piano. Right. He would play some kind of part, yeah. you know. And he had an idea for the drums and the bass, you know. And my thing was, because the harp is like the frosting on the cake. Right. Although there's lots of stuff where I'm playing like a line or a part right. that is an inherent part of the machine. You know, all this, all these parts meshing together. Right. But. Still, the harp is, because of the sound of the harp, it, it's a thing that's on top, you know? It's kind of like the frosting on, on Well, a they must have liked harmonica to give you as much, you know, space. Oh, they, space. Were, all, they were all, we were all harp freaks. I was going to say, you know, I mean, the, oh, fact yeah. that, the fact that they gave you so much, uh, you know, in, in so many solos in those songs. Right. And the other thing I got to give you credit for, man, is your solos are so inventive. Yeah. No, they nice. really are. I mean, the way you played, you know, a lot of those solos, it's like, to me, it's like, I mean, I hear it on the radio, I go, wow. Yeah, like Mean Love. Uh, there's a whole slew of them that you did <laughs> that are really, uh, yeah. you know, they're really creative solos. Thank you, Mark. And and very different as, as to what you'd hear in rock and roll. Yeah. You know. And a lot of that... I was very fortunate to be involved in the band the way I was because when we were in the studio or any time we were working on this stuff, yeah, they were incredibly supportive. I mean, we all worked hard right. on on like if I, you know if the idea was to have a two chorus harp solo or whatever it was going to be, and my harp solos tend to be on the shorter side compared to some stuff that you'd find where people just go on and on and on, you know, right. like we all like kind of short and sweet. You right. Know? 
Um, but I had a tremendous amount of support from the guys. They were all harp freaks. That's, that's every wonderful. one of them. Every yeah. one of them loved little Walter. That's awesome. Ju loved little Walter Jr. Wells, James Cotton. That is so awesome. I mean, with a thing like that and all the support yeah. I was getting, all the help I was getting, uh -huh. it was really cool. But on the other hand, because of the way we worked when we get, we got together to to uh, every day to work on stuff, work on new tunes. Mm -hmm. um, the process actually kind of boiled down to most of the time me just sitting there in the room listening to what they're doing and thinking about what I'm going to do, but I wouldn't be playing mm -hmm. because until they got the back, you know, until they got the backup together. Right. There wasn't a hell of a lot of point. The about rhythm me track playing. and yeah, yeah get the rhythm that. groove. You know, yeah. get all that, the foundation of the thing, get that solid. You know, and I would be recording what they were doing on my uh, Sony TC One Ten A. I remember this right. shoebox size cassette recorder that was really a great little machine. You know, and um, so I would record all these rehearsals. Then when I got home. That's when I would actually start to construct your work, work on the stuff. 